today at 110 West 3rd Street in Howell, New Jersey. This was the childhood home where his eminent Sam Toku Rimichi grew up in. And uh, you'll see it's a massive house. And it was built by hand by Rimichi's foster parents, Boris and Dana Bugayev. This is the backyard of the Bugayev's house. You can see it's pretty massive and they used to have loads of family gatherings and parties and, and lunches out here in the backyard. I just remember this little boy who kept coming. <laughs> he kept uh, knocking on the door and coming here with uh, Buddha drawings he had uh, drawn and colored, and he wanted to uh, talk about Buddhas. <laughs> We went to pick him up, I think it was somewhere April or May, and it must have been May. And um, we got the call, so we went to, uh, drove to Philadelphia to pick him up. And uh, we got him, and he was this little person, and he was really small and, you know, skinny, and he just, but he was a happy person. And then uh, we, you know, we brought, got him in the car, and we rode home with him, and he didn't speak any English, so it was difficult. <laughs> But uh, we managed, and then um, Dechen uh, Ming came and stayed with us and was the translator for us, and, okay. and that helped out a lot. Basically, it was decided by Dechen uh, Ming. She uh, wanted to bring him over from Taiwan, and they did that, and then she wanted him to go to a family, and we had spent a lot of time with her and her daughter, so she decided that my parents would be good parents for him. And uh, she asked and said, you know, would you, you know, take him? And they said, okay. When I was little, um, he made me the most amazing dollhouse. And I tell the story because there's two things that re I remember him so fondly from was this beautiful dollhouse that he made me, complete with little curtains and everything. Like it was, it was just amazing. And then shortly after that, he made me the most beautiful doll out of corn husks. Even at that young age that I was, I was just so amazed at that. And that will stay with me forever. That, image of him of this young boy making like something so special like most kids wouldn't make a dollhouse for somebody from scratch like for no reason, for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and he did his giving nature he was funny <laughs> we uh and then we, we just, you know, we had a pool in our backyard uh -huh. when Rinpoche first came. Uh, I guess he never went swimming ever before. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we'd go swimming and didn't know what the heck he was talking because he was speaking in Taiwanese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just splashing and smiling. He was a really um, happy-go-lucky kid. Always smiling, very good disposition when we were younger. I want to introduce you to everybody. Oh, My, uh, these people are all from Malaysia. Oh, Malaysia. Oh, yeah. My cousin is a Rinpoche, I told you. Did oh, I tell you? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. These are his students, and they're making an a, a autobiography of his life. And he's building a very large temple there oh. for 700 people. Oh, oh. He's building right now. He's in the middle of building the We're almost finished. largest, oh. largest, <laughs> largest uh, Tsongkhapa statue, right? Oh. 118 feet, Buddha. Oh. How nice. Fun. I don't think his childhood maybe was as happy or as carefree as ours was. Yeah. But I don't, you know, I wasn't living in the home. And, and like I said, the few times that I was in there, it was always very quiet. Everything was always very perfect. His parents wanted to raise him 
as you know a, a, the way a, a boy would have been raised you know in, in Western Mongolia. But here he was in America with all the Western influence, and and you know he wanted to be his own person. And I think they were very um, almost more than the other parents of the comic kids I knew. I think they fought him especially hard on that. So he he was forced to kind of be two people, which I think is why. So he would go to his home and he would be the you know the proper you know comic son. Yeah. And then we would go as far away as we possibly could, you know, to Turkey Swamp on our bikes, you know. I don't remember serious injuries, but it was very common, you know, that he would be hit, he would be abused, you know, have a bruise or maybe a black eye in school and things like that. And that was not unusual for Bertie. And it was also not unusual for some of the other comic kids. It was always stress. I think I was the only, um, I had an ulcer by the time I was 17. It was very stressful. Um, you just never knew, but you just took it one day at a, at a time. The, the teenage years and high school and everything was quite um, traumatic and tumultuous. I mean, you just never knew. In, in what way? Well, you just never knew. Uh, it was like walking on eggshells. You didn't know when you know, an out outburst would happen or, or something, and it just... You know, if you go a whole day without an outburst, you know, and then it's another day, and it's like, it was a good week. So you just never knew. But you're a child, you don't have control. You never have control. I even told Percha that same thing. I said, no matter what, how it was, it was not her. It was her sickness that was doing to, to you. I says, you know, she loved you. She would never say no. You want something, she'll do it and make it. That's how kind she was, you know. She had a, a heart of gold. Always giving. Donna used to always buy us with me and Gija. I was infant, so and Gija was maybe three years old, maybe oh, that beautiful. time. So it was a lot of things that she had to, you know, take care of it, you know. My old, not much as my older sister, but Donna was the one, you know, she wanted to do, she wanted to help. Even in Germany, she was always the one who brought food, find the food for us, nobody else. But I do remember him always coming to our house and saying he was, I told my parents I'm coming over here, but he was really going over to the temple because the Rashi Gempling was only right around the corner from our house. Uh -huh. So that was a big secret. There was no way that they could find out that he was going there and oh, taking, yeah. you know, like lessons from the monk there. But he really, he couldn't even speak about, even just having like a normal person can say, I, I believe in God or I'm very spiritual or he couldn't, he couldn't say that to them. You, you would think that if somebody spoke to me that way, even if I didn't feel the same way, I would appreciate that they did mm -hmm. and they couldn't appreciate it. They, they so tried to that. squash it down. Mm -hmm. I think they wanted him to just be this good little Kelmic boy who grew up and married a Kelmic girl <laughs> and carried on Boris's name. That's yeah. what, that's what he, I think was really in the back of of his mind. He used to sit in the closet and, and pray. In the closet? Yeah, in his room upstairs because God and Donna wouldn't let him. And so she, he used to hide from her and, and pray. So that I remember because there was big arguments all the time over that. And then uh, she didn't like uh, Geshe Tarchin because he was the one teaching him uh, uh, whatever. And uh, she, as a matter of fact, went and argued with the uh, Geshe Tarchin. And that's when, I think, not too long after that, he ran away from home. Apparently, remember she had shared with us that she was going around the Kalmyk community talking about Geshe Tarchin and saying bad things. Do you remember any of the things that she said? No. 
But did you hear those rumors that she was? Uh, I heard that she, no, she, she, as a matter of fact, she told us that she had an argument with him, but that's about it. Okay. I don't know about whether she told everybody else, but uh, uh, I like Gashi Tarchin. So. What did she say about the argument? Did she tell you what she said? Or? Because she, she was teaching Burcha uh, to, to pray, mm -hmm. and uh, she didn't want that because she wanted Burcha to be, get married and have children and stuff. I was glad for him. That he wanted to be a monk? No, that he became whatever he, you know, I was, I was proud of him. That's, that's the one, uh, one thing that, uh, I mean, to attain whatever place he has, in, it's, a, it's a pretty big honor. I always thought that it was inside of him, not, not because somebody was teaching him or whatever. It, was, it had to be inside of him. He had to want to really be whatever. And I babysat for him one summer because there was no school, so he, they needed somebody to watch him all day. And he was just, I was, I was telling you, he was mischievous and, and um, a real prankster. When I was older, when I was babysitting for him, I was 15. Okay. By the time I was 17, 18, I got my driver's license. So that's when I used to drive him around all the time. I'd call him up and say, you want to go to the boardwalk with me? Or he'd come over and say, let's take a ride to the boardwalk. Because I was obsessed with Ms. Pac-Man. But I would take him to the arcade all the time mm -hmm. and play Ms. Pac-Man, and we'd play like the poker games mm -hmm. and everything. And, and it was just fun, just to go away. We're a very close family. I mean, obviously, you know, we had my, you know, my three aunts and my uncle all live in the Howell area here, and we lived in Lakewood, which is not only 10 minutes, 15 minutes away. So as a family, we grew up with all of our first cousins, you know, so we were more than just first cousins. We were like brothers and sisters because we were all kind of around the same age. And, you know, and I remember he would be over at our house for a few weeks, sometimes two weeks, you know three weeks just hanging out with with us watching us because my mother worked shift work so she was there for us in the morning but she'd have to go to work at night and if my father had to work late or anything like that and um, little Brucia would, would watch us he would be babysitting us Like I said, he was like our protector. You know, I don't think he ever let, let on when he was upset or sad, you know. And if he was sad, you know, he would just say, it's okay, I'll get over it. You know, he'll hug us or rock us or, you know, he was very, um, when we needed him to be there for us, he was always there for us. And I remember this one time when um, my mother was working late and he was babysitting and all the power went out. And it was like a bad storm. It was like huge, like thunders and lightnings. And it was like, and I think it was, I'm trying to think if it was before the explosion next door, we were scared. And, um, and so, you know, um, Rin Boucher had said, all right, all right. You know, he made this little altar, like on the floor out of a box. He, put, he draped it. And that was one thing that he always taught us was how like how you should you, you should handle the Buddhas and how you should handle every, like everything should be clean and neat, kept in a neat place, um, you know, always giving it the respect. Um, and so he had it, he had draped over, he had went and found this really nice cloth, laid it over, had, he had done the oils and um, did the candles and the incense and um, he got my mom's mala beads. And I remember him showing me, us how to do our hands, like, because he was the one that he had said, it was like we would have to hold our hands with our thumbs in. Mm -hmm. And um, and for the longest time, we would always hold it like this. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, 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 you got to hold it with your thumbs in. And he was the one that showed us how to do that. He had us all recite Om Mani Bhaman Home. And he kept saying, okay, let's just say it, let's just say it. Everyone close your eyes and let's just say it. Oh, my bum home, oh, my bum home. And he's like, if we say it enough, it's, you know, everything's going to be better. And, um, and that's how he got, he got us through that night. I 
our favorite memory with him was singing Donna Summers. <laughs> yeah. And always being the youngest one, you know, you always kind of like cast off to the side, but me and my sisters would always be the backup singers. And I remember one time begging him, can I please see, sing lead? I want to sing lead, you know? And he'd be like, the next song, the next song. <laughs> Never got to sing lead. <laughs> No, <laughs> he just enjoyed singing the lead. <laughs> and he was good, don't get me wrong, he was very good. He was like a big brother to me and my sisters. We, you know, we did everything together and, and we saw him as that and he took care of us. He'd always hug us and make us feel so belonged and so loved and it was, um, it was a constant thing every time we saw him. It was in sincerity that not many people, you know, show and he definitely showed and um, it was very, very much known that he cared very much about you. We're here now in Rashid Gemper Ling, which was the uh, family temple of Rimbach's foster father, Boris. So uh, this is the main prayer hall, and this is where Rinpoche spent most of his time whenever he had any spare time. And of the three Mongolian temples that were in Hao, Rinpoche spent uh, most of his time here in Rashid Gemper Ling. So he would come here whenever he had free time and do hundreds and thousands of mantras and prostrations and prayers. He would come here to receive teachings from Serame Kenso Lop Sangtat Chin Rinpoche, and it would have been in this very gompa, in this room, that Rinpoche received the Vajrayogini initiation when he was a teenager, which was really one of the most significant moments of his life, um, even up until now. What I remember about Rinpoche is he didn't find a lot of time to play, do the things that I was in common with me. Um, he would go to church a lot and spend a lot of time at the temple. I went to the Nitsen one okay. right there on okay. 6th Street and um, I took him there a couple of times because uh -huh. you know we normally did that after school would say okay let's go to church and he would stay there longer than I and I would go back and play. Um, but as we got older he started spending a lot more time at the church. From the very beginning, he is something different than other boys. You know, other boys are different. Oh, he's young. I, I know he's coming here. He is a... Uh, uh, he's a... Uh, uh, Rinpoche, they I mean, incarnated. Yes. Something like a holy uh, man in past lifetime. He uh, familiar with the uh, Pankas paintings, Buddhas. And he come here, and he come here, and, young, and he never go out, you know. And then uh, he looking, looking at the Buddha's picture, and he's so interested. And he interested, and then uh, I go somewhere, and coming back, he's still there looking. For <laughs> 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 and then I thought, oh yeah, he's uh, some kind of uh, not somebody to teach him to come here, but from he inside. The main thing was uh, he went and found uh, the Geshe Tsutim Gelsen and Kelchi Song Rinpoche and. Uh, Everything else really didn't matter. Everything else was just uh, things that happened. But the main thing was he was uh, telling about how he uh, met uh, Kelji Song Rinpoche and that eclipsed everything bad. Yeah. Do you remember him meditating in Turkey Swamp? I do, yeah. By I, the lake? By the lake and more so you, in order to get away from everybody, because there's a little boardwalk at the lake at Turkey Swamp, and in order to get away from everybody, you would have had to walk to the other side of the lake where there was no boardwalk. And we would go to the other side and you could see the lake then through the trees and that was a better place 
Totalmente. You see up there, that's Highway 9. This is West 3rd Street, which is just off the highway. And um, it was at that very spot that Rinpoche stood to hitchhike to run away to New York. He had a hard time in in New Jersey, and he had to come. He wanted to come to LA. Uh, why? It was pushing him to come here for some reason, and I think that reason was to be with Geshe-la and his Zongren Pache and teachers like that. Instead of, he had to get away, and he had a very difficult time. He had no money, he, and when he came here, he was broke. And so geshe you know, he got in with geshe and geshe took him in. And then he told him, you know, you're still going to have to go out and get a job. Life was tough. It's not easy. He didn't have a sponsor. Nobody has sponsors out here very much. You have to work for everything. He told Geshe that he wanted to be his attendant. And Geshe said, okay. Virtually at that time, he really went and he did a lot of work for Geshe. Like I said, he hadn't even anticipated the things that he wanted, needed. He knew how to do that. He never said no. Guess I would send him to the store. Okay, put on his shoes and run. And he'd run. He'd run to the store. You need something real quick? Okay, okay. You need something copied? Okay. He never he never said no to Guess But I look at him as a living Buddha. You know. And you're so very fortunate to have his lineage and to have him teach you. Whatever it is, if you don't like his teachings, whatever it is, you get something out of him, just being with him. He is a living Buddha. So, and that's what he was like. He, uh, somebody needed help, he was there to help him. He didn't ask, he, he, you didn't, he didn't ask me, oh, can you help me take this down, or can you help me do this? He was volunteering if he could help you. And it made him so happy to help somebody else that he got to do something for somebody else. And, and when they go on away smiling and everything, he was happy. He's just the same man. <laughs> He's the same one. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad he's still that way. Yeah, I'm so glad. My yeah. grandpa Shane now. Yeah. Small boy with very, very strong uh, dharma inclinations. He was a kind kid. You can feel it in him that he was something special. To him, I am so in awe just hearing about what you've accomplished and what you're doing. Silly, okay. caring, and fun. I always remember him to be fun. A fun childhood memory, okay, a big part of my childhood. Ever since he, he came into my life, he was a very unusual child. He was always smiling and always happy. He was a happy little person. and He's knowledgeable and very compassionate. Some parts of it is, is sad, and some parts of it is, I guess, sort of happy. And now I, I hope he's happy right now. I am so, so, so proud of him.